that, and I'm not going to uh, introduce a guest speaker today. Oh, it's your first time. Yeah, that's that's well, good and bad for you. That's that cuts both ways. Our pastor. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. That is fabulous. Thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Y'all have been so kind, and um, we've appreciated the hospitality. I have my terrible towel. And so um, that, that definitely makes it official. Uh, my daughter is uh, probably halfway back to Phoenix by now. She flew, I think, took off at 8 a.m. this morning. She's got to get back to work. Somehow she managed all those days off to drive with me out here, and it was a lot of fun. And uh, then my wife is kind of wrapping up the house. That is sold, of course. It's sold. We had seven offers in uh, two days. So, so I told the agent, isn't that great? I told the agent, should we wait for more? And he goes, no, no, this is good. This is fine. And so, uh, so that closes on the 29th. And then she's going to uh, fly back here on, the, um, on that weekend. So I may go back during the week if she needs a little help wrapping that thing up, but um, she is more handy than I am. The old farm girl, Ohio farm girl, she is just fine. I will get in the way. So, uh, so anyway, the Lord is good, and I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you for being here this morning on uh, the first day of NFL season at Steelers this afternoon. What in the world was there a, an event planned after church today when there's a Steelers game? I'm just saying, I don't want to complain right off, to the ba- right off the bat, but that, someone didn't look at a calendar. Now that it's downstairs, right after church, right? Uh, is there a TV? I mean, when's the game on? One o'clock? Oh, that's okay. They have to warm up a little bit. It's doable. Okay, so we're all right. Um, so, um, so that's going to be fun right afterwards. If, um, if you didn't bring anything, just go down, grab something off a table, and walk up with it. So I've done it for years. It actually, it actually works. And so um, would love the fellowship. That'd be a great time together. Uh, three weeks, just a three-week brief series on uh, pray it forward. Pray it forward. The idea is it's a new school year for, for many, and as a church, it's a bit of a new season. There's a great, rich history to this church, and like every church, it just challenges what's the next one. They're just going to keep coming along the way, and we will, of course, continue to stay the course as you have already, and God has clearly blessed you for that. But as we're looking ahead and going forward, how do we pray forward? We want to proceed and work our way as you have already modeled in prayer. I think that how many of you participated in that uh, Tuesday prayer group? That's great. Remind me, who was it that uh, led that and started? Yeah, you guys, fabulous. That's, um, that's one of those things where we really don't understand the significance of what that did for us. Thank you. And for those of you that participated, I know many of you couldn't. And you prayed on your own, and that was equally as important. But as all of this starts, we need to pray ourselves forward and say, we are all about, more than anything, we want to bring glory and love and praise to God. We want to love one another, and then we want to lead as many people as we can into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. There is a clarity to that. There are many things a church wants to participate in or a church becomes that are all good. What do they say? The enemy of the best is the good? We could do good things, but we could maybe miss the best thing. And the best thing is, every day we just got to sit back and say, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing, which is glory to God, love one another in order to lead as many people as we can into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. This is what's challenging to me, is the Apostle Paul, in the middle of intense suffering, it was remarkable what he prayed for. 
in the most intense of suffering, we will see that he prayed for a boldness to proclaim Christ. And I pause, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, that too. Is that what I lead with? Honestly, is it even top ten? So we translate quickly and look to the challenges that you have and that I have in my life and when it's everything from finance to health, what do we pray for? I'm going to be front of the line. I'm going to say what it is. When there is lack of health, I'm going to just be praying to God that that is healed. It's, it's fair game. I get that. But Paul didn't do that. So somehow I've got to match my life with the example that Paul has left us to say what are the values of which we actually pray for. When our kid is sick, when those test results come back, we've been there. And I know how consumed I am with bring health. I want health. I want health. It's funny. That's not what Paul prayed That wasn't his greatest concern. So we want to look at what do we we pray for as we're praying forward as a family, individually, as well as a church. My brother is also a pastor. He is two and a half years older than I am. He's in the north part of Phoenix, almost coincidentally that we ended up in the same town. Uh, He's in Anthem, uh, Arizona. He was speaking at a conference, and he has a daughter, has a daughter that at the time was third grade. My brother was walking around the corner and heard his daughter, Tatum, talking to this little kid she just met. And he kind of stood back a minute and thought, oh, this is kind of cute conversation. The little boy opened up to her and said, uh, said, yeah, my, my dad's in jail. And my brother's like, wow. Okay, let's see what my girl, she's going to pull through. And Tatum goes, oh. She put her head down and goes, man, I wish my dad was in jail. (laughs) And my brother around the corner was like, (laughs) like, what just happened? That is not the compassion I was looking for out of my daughter. I'm going to tell you right now, if this guy ever ends up in jail, I'm going to admit it. I I will only have one prayer. Get me out of here. That's going to be my only prayer. Every letter you get from me, every smoke signal that I figure out how to get out of is going to be, get me out of here. And you and I have wonderful friends or family members that are likely in jail. It's a real thing. There are some wonderful people that are incarcerated. We've all broken God's law. They happen to break man's law and happen to get caught at it. And maybe it wasn't a pattern. It was something that went bad. And here they are now X amount of years. What do you pray for them? What do they pray for as a follower? This is exactly what we have from the Apostle Paul. We literally have a prayer of his in the most intense of situation of health concern. And it's the same one that we can have as well. If you have a Bible there, we're going to give some context. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. This is when he lists all of his troubles. He's a little crazy for doing it, so he says. But he just lists his problems. And they're pretty remarkable. I've never quite heard anyone say this before, but I think for context it might be worth noting, when he lists these things, look at verse 23, 2 Corinthians 11, 23. Are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. I'm talking like a madman with far greater labors, far more imprisonments. Okay, here we go. With countless beatings, often near death, five times received at the hands of the Jews the 40 lashes less one, right? Because 40 is to kill them, so they wouldn't do that, so they do 39. A little technicality. Five times he had that happen. 
But he goes on. He, he has so much more. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Night and day I was adrift at the sea. Frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, dangers from our own people, danger from Gentiles, from the city, dangers of the wilderness, dangers of the sea, danger of the false brothers, in toil and hardship through many sleepless night, hunger, thirst, without food and cold, exposure. And apart from these things, there's daily pressure on my, my anxiety from all the churches. This is his list of, this is what's usually not mentioned on that list. This is only, with the timing of the writing, two-thirds of the way through his ministry. So I've often read where these were the experiences of suffering of Paul. No, this is the first two-thirds, and the odds are it got worse because he was beheaded in Rome. It didn't get better. That's the first two-thirds. This isn't a complete list. You know you've gone through suffering when you have categories. Through my journeys. Oh, you mean all the cities. Yeah, yeah, that. And these, these cities, that's one category of them. Uh, wilderness, that's another category. When you have categories of suffering, you know it's really bad. Our family went through... Uh, some strange things over the last five years while you guys were going through as a church, your bit of transition and things, we had, we had so many car accidents that I would send to family, I would just send a number, and they know what that meant. It was up to seven in a matter of two and a half years, four of which were totaled. Everyone in the family, in fact, the only one that didn't get in an accident was the blind one, our oldest which he was so proud of. He's like, you people, you people, my senior dog takes me to places. I'm fine. I haven't walked into one tree. But you people, it's like you have categories. It's hospital stays or you're doing this. He had categories. And in all of these categories, I know what I would be praying because I was there. Stop this from happening. Heal this person. That's the context. At the similar time of writing that very text in 2 Corinthians, we have Acts chapter 4. Take a look now. He's imprisoned. This is one of his sufferings in Acts 4. Listen to what he says. If you have a Bible, look at Acts 4. Starting in verse 23, just kind of get the mood of some of this. When they were released, they went on their friends, reported the chief priests and elders, lifted their voices together to God, and they said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of the Father David, your servant, said to the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage, the people plot in vain? kings of the earth set themselves and the rules were gathered, rulers were gathered together, set against the Lord and against the anointed. For truly in this city they were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and the plan predestined to take place. It's a great verse. And now look upon their threats and grant to your servants, here it goes, to continue to speak your word with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal, and the signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. It was the immediate answer. Here he is gathering and going, it's getting tough. And what does he pray for? He goes, this pressure's coming in, and the same people that hated Jesus are now hating us, and there wasn't a town that Paul wasn't kicked out of. And what's he pray for? Lord, and now Lord, we ask would you just give us a relief from the suffering for a season? 
Would you just protect your followers who love you so much? They love you so much, and they're in pain. They're so, would you release their pain? I'd been full wholeheartedly praying along, right, right along with him. It's not what he prayed. He prayed, Lord, if there is anything, what we're asking for right now, and now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. We want boldness to speak. It's revealing a value system. We can be so much like the world because when the world has physical or mental issues happening in their family, they're doing whatever they want to call it, whether it's prayer or hoping, whatever it is, they want it to go away. We do the exact same thing as the world, but what we're doing is we're using Christian words and we're using what we call prayer, but have the same request. And the request is this, my life right now is organized in such a way that I'm not happy. I don't like this. God, I need you to come and change this. And I am not really even going to rest until this is changed. I'm going to be in tension and anxiety until you make this illness go away or the mental struggle go away, the lack of friends, the lack of direction in my life, all of these things that make this go away. That is exactly what the world does in the same situation. There is no difference. The words are different because we Christianize it. It's the same prayer. How then does Paul rise above all of that and not even mention the fact, give relief? Because his values are different. Our values are different. And they are. It's not like we have to change our values, or I have to convince you to change your values. You don't. We just have to acknowledge them and pray that way. The truth of the matter is we would rather a child that is unhealthy, who has character and honesty and integrity and loves the Lord, than we would take a child that is successful in a mansion who doesn't love the Lord and is dishonest. Am I right? Of course that's right. You know what? Here's the good news. God wants the same thing. And the suffering that's in the life of your child is what's getting them to that point. We too often will be praying and asking God to remove something that is actually the conduit to get them to the point of which we value. Do you see that? We're literally working against the cause. I'm not going to ignore that. I don't want you in any pain, and I'm not a big fan of pain. I get a splinter, and my whole house has to stop. I'm like, dig it out. It's ugly. I know it's bad. And they're like, we can't even see it. And I said, because you're selfish. Get it out. Get it out. I don't want pain. I don't want your child to suffer. Go bankrupt? Mental illness? Yeah, you have cancer. Everyone's going to rally around and possibly bring you a meal. You have mental illness and you're sitting here right now with it? No one's rallying around you. That is very painful. That adds a tremendous level of pain to your anxiety, to your depression. And all of our effort is, I want it to go away. God, make it go away. No, you, let's, let's talk very specific. God, yes, I do want it to go away, and I will pray that. But God, give me the strength to persevere it until and if, but until you decide for it to be over. Which means you and I can find our contentment in the midst of the struggle and not just the relief when it's over. Relief when it's over is exactly what the world does. 
The uniqueness of our relationship with God through faith in Jesus is that during the struggles of life and the pain of divorce and financial ruin, in the midst of it, we can find contentment and peace. Go to the world with that, and they'll say you're crazy. You're in denial. No, you need to understand my Lord. He wants me to be honest, and he wants me, in this text specifically, he wants me to be honest and have integrity and all of that, be Christ-like. He wants me to be bold with the message of Christ. What a boldness. And I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I struggle with this. Because I will pray for you, and I want you to pray for me when the diagnosis is bad and there's a tremendous loss because it's painful. I want there to be an ease of pain. But I don't know if that's God's will, that you're healed. He's done some great healings. Many of you can testify to it. I mean, the cancer was there, it was in the, the photo, we all saw it, and then it was gone. God heals. But I don't know if that's all what he always does. But I do know what he always wants, a boldness and a clarity of the gospel. So when we are in a hospital bed, Yes, all of those prayers, but then that we would be compassionate and bring Christ into the lives of people that we're in contact with. Take a look at one last text. I normally don't jump around like this. This is a bit out of character, but you wouldn't know that, which is why I'm telling you that. A little out of character. Uh, Ephesians 6. There's values. There's a book. Uh, there's an old author, A.W. Pink. Uh, he has gleanings. That was kind of his thing, gleanings of Genesis, gleanings. It was gleanings of the Apostle Paul. And it was a fun book. I don't know when it was written, 60s, 70s. And all it was, uh, gleanings from Paul uh, by A.W. Pink, was a list of all prayer statements of the Apostle Paul. He took every statement where he would say, I pray that you, or I praying, or anything to do with, he lists it. Well, immediately, I just like looking at the list to see what's missing. Because let's take all of our prayers, and let's list all of our prayers and everything that we pray for. Not, not people, I mean, it's people, but what are you praying for that person for, Right? So, a list of all of your prayers, and categorize what percentage of them are this, what percentage are that. Because Paul's, Paul's was amazing. He didn't pray for the sick of anybody. And I'm like, that's impossible. He didn't actually even pray for the lost world. That makes no sense, does it? It does make sense. We don't pray for the lost world. We're praying for the church, that the church would be the church, that we would proclaim the gospel of Christ, that we would live the gospel of Christ in the middle of all your sufferings, that you and I would have the character to proclaim Christ and to grow in our faith and become stronger and stronger, which is a witness to a lost world that will come to know Christ. That's why he didn't pray for the world. Right? We always ask, God, bring America a revival. Do we not realize what that is asking for? Asking for a revival in America has nothing to do with the lost in the world. What it has to do with, it's revive. We're asking for the church, the body of Christ, to be revived, which will lead to the conversion and discipleship of the world. That's what revival is. That's why Paul never prayed. 
He was always praying for the church of. He was praying for them, the believers at. That they would stay strong in their faith. That they would proclaim Christ. Paul says in Ephesians 6, Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you'll be able to withstand the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers of the present darkness, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God to withstand and stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness. You see, these, we're listing things that are prayers. These are things that we would pray. As shoes for your feet, put readiness given for the gospel of peace, circumstances, shield of faith, helmet of salvation, sword of the Spirit. I know that suffering is real, and I know that as a church, there's been challenges, as there are in every and there's challenges in each of our lives. And if you happen to be in a place where it's kind of quiet, shh, shh, enjoy it. Because <laughs> it's coming, right? I mean, is that not? I was, I was sitting with, um, oh, this is a name drop. Eh, maybe it isn't to you. Um, Wayne Grudem. Wayne Grudem is a writer, and he is the editor of the ESV Study Bible and Bible. I was sitting with Wayne Grudem and his wife. And Wayne, with a wonderful smile and grace on his, he's the nicest guy, he looked at his wife. He goes, you know what, honey? I don't know anybody. She, he goes, oh, let's say over 50, who has not had a major crisis. And she goes, you know, honey, I think you're right. Loss of a sibling, that's very painful. Loss of a child, if you've lost a child, I don't even know what to say to you. Except you know what God felt like giving his son Jesus. That's so painful. I'm so sorry for that. Or finances, you're a place in life you thought you'd be fine, and you're not. And you're like, huh, oh, bad decisions or it happened against you, it doesn't matter. You're in a bad spot. All of this is real. We all face it. Kids, having a kid sick is horrible. How many times as a parent you'd say, God, give me that sickness times five, but let my kid be free. Let my kid walk or let my kid see or hear. Let, please protect my kid. And it's God's in tears saying, I am protecting your kid. I'm not against you. I'm working with you. The value is not being able to walk. The value is not being rich. The values in life are not these things of being free. A friend of mine just got out of jail. He was in 13 years. He's only 33. 13 years. Just got out. We just had a party for him right before I left. To see in, in his face the freedom that he had in jail, the ministries. There wasn't a Bible study he didn't go to, interacting with people, writing letters, and that's how I knew him because we wrote all the time. And, and I'm like, you weren't bound by that. He goes, no, that wasn't my problem. My problem was in here. It was my walk with Christ. I needed people to pray for me for my walk with Christ and my proclaiming the gospel. My problem was not the cell. Is that a different level? I said, yeah, but we want you out. He goes, I want to get out too. I'd love to be out. And if God could do all of that with me being not in here, I'll take it. Right? So we don't ignore the health requests. And we don't pray, I want that prayer. I want you to be free and healthy. I'm praying that, but as a means to an end, so that you can proclaim Christ. Uh, I'll, a couple thoughts is, I had, uh, we had two anointings of, uh, within an, uh, like an hour and a half of each other. They were to both elderly women. They were both uh, widows. And... Uh, the first one was like 
like me. It would be like my life. So she came in and she was diagnosed with cancer. She's kind of going through it alone. It was so sad. And she's explaining it and she, praying for healing, um, of which I have, am praying for as much as she is. And we gathered, there were about a dozen of us pastors, and we gathered around and we're praying over her and hugged her and loved her and, and off she went. We had about a 20 minute break. And this other gal came in. It was also cancer. And I could just see it was different. We all saw it was different. The first one was one of us. It was, we just, this was different. She's on a furlough from South Africa. Her husband died uh, in South Africa, and she now has cancer. They have an orphanage, and I'm like, oh, boy, yeah, and I'm complaining about my life here. And she's got an orphanage, and her prayer, we're like, what did you come for? She goes, I, I, want, I want a healing. And I'm like, well, we do too, and we're going to pray because the Bible says call the uh, leaders of the church, anoint with oil, believing that God can heal, and I believe he can, and we all agreed. And she goes, it's critical that I'm healed. Say, okay, I'm, I'm with you. She goes, if I can't, with the loss of my husband, if I cannot secure the funding and hand this orphanage over to somebody, there are going to be countless children not knowing Christ and growing in their faith. I felt that big. I felt like I was in Sunday school, a little kid listening to a giant of the faith. And I'm like, right, right. Uh, that's, we want the same thing. I think the first one would have said that. I think if I said, don't you want to be healed so that you can help your kids grow in their faith and you can proclaim Christ, I think she would have said, oh, absolutely. But I saw it. My brother was in that meeting with me, and we walked out of that, and we walked to an office, and we didn't say anything. We didn't make any connections yet. And he said, we just met with a giant. And I went, yes, we did just meet with a giant. He goes, I just learned a lot in the last 30 minutes. And I said, Randy, I did too. My values are shaped like the world's. Of course they are. It's all we see on TV. It's all we're reading about in the news and social media. And it's, it's all we're hearing. We think like the world does. And the problem is not so much that as the fact that we don't know it. That's the problem. I don't want to think like the world. Yes, I'm, suffering's going to be painful. And I don't want it. And I definitely don't want it for my kids. But our whole family knows which of our family, of my three kids, which has the deepest walk with Christ. The one with a morality that is just right next to Jesus, just a, just a little below. It's the one that went through the most challenges. And he knows it. He's never asked to be healed. We've never got, called together elders to pray and anoint my oldest son through all of his diagnosis for blindness. Never prayed once. Because I wanted it to be him. And I said, bud, this is what we can do. He goes, okay, thanks. I said, we could bring together a dream team of people to pray. He goes, thanks, Dad. I said, you say the word. He goes, I will. Right? It's almost like the other way. It's almost like, no, son, you've got to understand. It's in the Scriptures to pray for healing. And he goes, yeah, I just don't feel like I'm sick. I'm limited in some ways, but, Dad, I'm, I have more going for me in other ways. Okay. How is that possible? No, let's not miss this, because the very thing that we're praying 
wholeheartedly to get out of is the very thing that God has to make us to what He wants us to be. And if in your mind you're right now thinking, well, then should I never pray for healing? Because it's always, I want you to struggle with that. I don't want to solve that for you. Because we rise above that issue to a higher level to say, God, let me be clear with what I want in my life. I want to walk with you. I want to be a man, woman, child with integrity and honesty, and I want to be sold out with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and I want to proclaim it clearly. Period. Now, God, as far as my circumstances, I want all my circumstances to get me there. I hate this sickness. Buying another car. Our insurance, I don't even tell you what our, our car insurance was. My buddy said, it's not long before you're going to be insured with the general. I'm going to be all the way down to the general because no other buddy would touch us. I don't want to do that. But God, my prayer is bigger if it's, I'm going to stick it out as long as you want it there. And it might be forever. I've heard with mental illness, people say, oh, you can really get through a lot of that. You know what? I don't know. I've heard others say, no, get used to it. You're going to live with it the rest of your life. Oh, which is it? Different for everybody. Walk with God. Proclaim the greatness of who Christ is. God, our prayer is, along with Paul, let me be bold with the message of Christ. And these things, I don't know if I may not go to the greatest college, and I want that for my kid, but maybe they won't, or maybe they won't go to college. Some of the best is that they don't go to college. I don't know the answer to these things, but I do know he wants us to have integrity and honesty. He wants us to walk closely with the Lord, and he definitely wants our eyes to be out of here into a community in which we can be bold with the message of Christ. Would you agree with that? And if we hold off a little bit on that, we will turn inward and we will all worry about ourselves and our sicknesses and, our, and I'm all for it. But not when it's to the exclusion of be bold with the message of Christ. I want more than anything my family to walk with the Lord. And they are right now. And many of you don't have that. You did everything right. It's the best you could. If you have a child or a grandchild that's walking away from the Lord, I know how painful that is. And I'll pray along with you that they walk with God. But we also pray for ourselves that we proclaim Christ. In the midst of all that suffering, that's what Paul did, proclaim Christ. But what a shame if you're sitting here listening or you found us online and, and you don't know Christ. You know about it. You've heard it. You've sat in church services. You've heard it. But you've never placed your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ with your life. Salvation, eternity, yes, that and your life today. All of your circumstance. You're trusting him with all of it. The only way we can have an access to God, a confidence of life, Jesus said, I brought you life to its fullness, abundant life, through faith in Jesus Christ. If you don't have that or know that, I want to give you an opportunity that you can. For the rest of us, that we would open up that thinking as we're praying forward, have the dominant prayer, yep, Let's be more bold in proclaiming the message of Christ. Pray with me right now, if you would. Heads are bowed. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, do it right now. You can tell Him. It's quiet. Between you and Him, you can pray right now, and you can pray to Him, Heavenly Father, I need you. I'm sorry for my sin. I need Jesus. I pray in my belief in Him. I trust Him 
for life and life abundantly to its fullness. And Heavenly Father, for those that prayed along with me, we give you praise and thanks. For the rest of us, Lord, we do suffer and we're going to tell you about it. Unashamedly, we're going to tell you we're hurting, we're suffering. But we're also asking boldly that you would give us the confidence, the clarity of thought, the boldness to share the message of Jesus with a lost world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Stand with me, if you would, as we sing uh, one last song together. If you need prayer, if you've come in with a struggle of some sort, we did talk suffering, right? Would you agree, age 50 and up, hasn't about everybody? Why are you looking at me? Oh, that's good, because I don't know people well enough, so if I stumbled on it, it's an accident. But am I, is that true? And Christ is amazing, isn't he? He's remarkable what he does for us, but we're also as a body to love and care for one another that while we're singing or right when we're finished as you dismiss us, if you want prayer, maybe a few of us can be up here, we would be more than happy to pray with you, to pray for you. We want to support one another as we move forward. Thank you, John.